Turn with me in your Bibles now to Judges chapter 17. We're continuing our walk through the history of the Judges, this record of the Judges between the conquest of the land under Joshua and the elders and the monarchy in Israel. We have this, what is becoming a dark period of history uh, in Israel as we consider uh, the period of the Judges. And tonight our text is Judges chapter 17, verses 1 through 13, the title of our sermon, Right in His Own Eyes. I think you'll see where we get that title from as we work through the text. Follow along with me now as I read Judges chapter 17, verses 1 through 13. Now there was a man from the mountains of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and on which you put a curse, even saying it in my ears... Here is the silver with me. I took it. And his mother said, May you be blessed uh, by the Lord, my son. So when he had returned the 1,100 shekels of silver, silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a molded image. Now, therefore, I will return it to you. Thus he returned the silver to his mother Then his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the the silversmith. And he made it into a carved image and a molded image. And they were in the house of Micah. The man Micah had a shrine and made an ephod and household idols. And he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. In those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now there was a young man from Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah. He was a Levite and was staying there. The man departed from the city of Bethlehem in Judah to stay wherever he could find a place. Then he came to the mountains of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? So he said to him, I am a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah. I am on my way to find a place to stay. Micah said to him, dwell with me and be a father and a priest to me, and I will give you 10 shekels of silver per year, a suit of clothes, and your sustenance. So the Levite went in. Then the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became like one of his sons to him. So Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, now I know that the Lord will be good to me since I have a Levite as a priest. This is the word of God, amen. Pray with me. Father in heaven, uh, it's a blessing, a privilege, Lord, a joy uh, to come back uh, this evening and to sit under your word and to hear from you. Thank you, Lord, for the blessed privilege, the blessed joy that it is to hear from you, to consider your revelation to us, to consider these accounts in history that you said is for our admonition. Uh, Thank you, Lord, for the blessing of taking instruction uh, from you, from your word. Uh, And help us, Lord, to learn. Uh, Spirit of God, please be with us now as we consider this text. And help us to learn. Help us to um, take hold, lay hold of the lessons here that are being taught through this uh, chapter in the Bible and this what will become a dark tale, a tragic tale in the history of Israel. And help us to learn, Lord, from her errors and to honor You in all that we do uh, and to maintain, Lord, true worship of You. You are worthy of our worship. Be with us, with, with us now as we consider Your Word. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Right in His Own Eyes, the title of our sermon. Text is Judges chapter 17. Verses 1 through 13. This evening in our study of Judges, we enter now the third and final section in the book of Judges, chapters 17 through 21. And these chapters, chapters 17 through 21, considered to be some of the darkest and most tragic chapters in all the Bible. With the death of Samson, the accounts of the Judges, the accounts of the Saviors, the Deliverers, have come to an end. And it has been the accounts of the judges that have led us to and essentially prepared us for the events that now follow in these final chapters in the book of Judges. 
in the lives of the judges and in the lives of those in Israel that they, the judges were raised up by God to deliver, we've seen and we see now a steady decline of basic morality. Just basic morality. We see the steady unraveling of any kind of biblical compass. It's all but absent now in these uh, sections of the text. And we see a steadily increasing in a pagan worldliness. The nation of Israel, God's covenant people, have become largely Canaanized. They've become like those nations that surround them, have been absorbed essentially by those nations that even live among them. They've become Canaanized. And we've become very familiar walking through the book of Judges. We've become very familiar with this pattern of decline. Right? The Lord pours out his grace on his people. He gives them security, gives them rest, gives them blessing on all sides. And then the next account begins with these words. Then the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. Our problem always begins with sin, doesn't it? <laughs> Their problem, our problem, always begins with sin. And with sin comes suffering. It's axiomatic. It's a truth we should all take to heart and consider. God then answers their wickedness with, and their ingratitude, answers that with judgment, answers it with retributive justice, delivering them into the hands of their enemies to punish them, and then God responds to their misery with mercy by raising up a judge to deliver them. And the pattern begins again. Then the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, Right, and the pattern continues. However, as we've seen, with each repetition of this tragic pattern, as you would expect, there is a spiritual root rot that is spreading under the surface, as it were, in Israel. Their spiritual condition is worsening. And so, as we see in the text, their physical condition is also worsening. As what beneath the soil in their heart, so to speak, is rotting and is decaying, what we see above the soil, so to speak, in their physical condition is also decaying, is also worsening. And so much of Israel's spiritual condition under the Old Covenant is illustrated for us through their physical condition. The two are related. And we see in their decaying spiritual condition, a decaying physical condition. As we see decay physically in the nation of Israel, we're to understand that as a result of decay spiritually in the heart of Israel. Does that make sense? So much of Israel's spiritual condition is illustrated through the physical. Physical, temporal blessings and judgments, all pointing to the spiritual realities that lie beneath the physical. Men look at the outward appearance, don't they? But God looks upon the heart. Israel is in grave spiritual peril. Exceedingly serious, exceedingly grave spiritual peril. And far more so than the mere temporal physical peril that they experience or often find themselves in. No matter how bad it gets with the Philistines, no matter how, it gets, how bad it gets with the Midianites, it's always worse in the heart of Israel dealing with their own wayward idolatry, their own wayward sin. The spiritual peril is far more damning than the physical peril. As a consequence now, this section of the book of Judges is marked then by a recurring theme. That theme is this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Samson's attitude of taking for himself what looked good in his own eyes, that attitude has now spread to his own tribe, the tribe of Dan. And as we'll see, that doesn't stop with Dan. It spreads to the whole nation. It wouldn't be long now before Israel altogether rejects God as king. You remember that story, that account from the first of, uh, the first of Samuel where Israel rejects God as king and wants a king for herself like what? Like all the other nations of the world around them. And listen, we need to take a, take a lesson from Israel, don't we? 
We need to consider how these things apply to us, uh, how they sit with us. The attitude of the whole nation that was seen in Samson's own heart can often and easily be found in the attitudes and inclinations of our own heart if we allow worldliness to seep into our worship. If you're not abiding in him, you will find yourself in spiritual peril. That's the text, that's the lesson of of John 15, isn't it? If you are not abiding in him, you will be fruitless as a branch, dried as a branch, good for nothing but to be bound up and thrown into the fire. If you're not abiding in him, you'll find yourself in spiritual peril. Israel can't seem to learn that lesson. You and I need to remember it. And we need to remember it from the exhortation of Israel here in the book of Judges. This is a lesson we need to remind ourselves of constantly. An incipient, increasing, uh, an inherent worldliness in your thinking, in your worship, in your uh, prayer life, whatever it is, is spiritual root rot to you. And it will cause the decay, ultimately the apostasy of a professing Christian. Like a branch attached to the vine, you must abide in him and he in you. Otherwise, you'll be barren and unfruitful. What does that mean? What does that look like? It looks like regular intake of God's word, right? You personally, regular intake of God's word, regular study, study of God's word, regular meditation on God's word, but not just regular intake of God's word personally, but sitting in the corporate Worship of God's people under the preaching and teaching of his word. We need that. And listen, there's a, in scripture, it becomes very clear to me in scripture, there is a special abiding presence of the Lord Jesus Christ by his spirit in the corporate gathering of his people that just simply isn't the same with us individually in our own prayer closet. We need both. We need reading. We need the corporate worship of God's people. We need the fellowship of God's people. We need time to pray. We need time to memorize, meditate. We need to check our obedience. All of these become means of grace through which we abide in him and he in us. If you avoid that, then this world will begin to leach into the soil of your heart. It's the way it is, folks. You and I know this the world will begin to leach into the soil of your heart, my heart, and we, perish the thought, become Canaanized ourselves. The end of your Canaanization, right? Your friendship with this world, adopting the attitudes and thoughts and interests of this world, the end of those things is death. Paul says, Romans chapter six, verse 22, but now, Having been set free from sin, having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. We need to cling to him, right? And the more that we cling to him, the more that we keep the world at bay, right? The more that we depend upon him, the more in prayer that we are, the more that we pour ourselves into his word, the more that he, by his spirit, pours his word into us, the more that we hold the world at bay. Now these chapters, chapter 17 through 21, can be divided into two sections. Each section representative of this devastating decline. The first section focuses on the tribe of Dan in chapters 17 and 18. The next section focuses on the tribe of Benjamin in chapters 19 through 21. Now, we move then in these chapters from considering the enemies without Now, in these chapters, to considering the enemy within. We've seen enemies without. Philistine, right? The Midianites. We've seen those nations that God set against Israel as judgment against Israel for their sin, enemies from without. Now the book makes a transition from 17 to 21 to enemies from within, the idolatrous fallen nature of their own sinful hearts is on display. And it's worth noting here in the tribe of Dan, in the tribe of Dan, chapter 17 and 18, we see a complete breakdown in acceptable worship. And then in the tribe of Benjamin, chapters 19 through 21, we see a complete breakdown in an acceptable morality. And listen, the two are tied together. 
The two are tied together. When you abandon the worship of God, you abandon biblical morality. You have no hope, right? Those two are intimately tied together. Well, what are the results of this breakdown? What are the results of this breakdown in the nation of Israel? We see apostasy and we see anarchy. What is going to flow from this breakdown is apostasy and anarchy. Israel physically, nationally, and more particularly, spiritually, in ruins. Well, with everyone doing what is right in his own eyes, we first see in Judges chapter 17, verse 1, a worldly worship. A worldly worship. Look at verse 1. Now there was a man from the mountains of Ephraim whose name was Micah. Ephraim and then Dan to its south are in the very heart of of Israel, just north of Judah. These aren't outskirts or tribes on the border. This is the very heart of Israel. This is affecting the very heart of Israel. The name Micah in its full Hebrew form, Mikayu, means who is like Yahweh. That's what the name means, who is like Yahweh. Well, obviously not this Micah. Micah is not like Yahweh. His family was obviously a wealthy family, and this Micah steals from his own mother. Look at verse 2. And he said to his mother, The 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you, and on which you put a curse, even saying it in my ears, here is the silver with me, I took it. Now to put this amount of silver into proper perspective, verse 10 tells of Micah offering a Levite 10 shekels in a shirt per year to live in his house as a Levite and be priest to him, right? To be his own personal priest. 10 shekels for a year. Uh, This is a considerable amount of silver that's been stolen. It's a large sum of money. And Micah fesses up, doesn't he? I heard your curse. Here's the silver, I took it. (laughs) Maybe he didn't want the curse to fall on him. So Micah, not only a thief, is also superstitious. Not only a brazen, heartless thief stealing from his own mother, but a brazen, heartless, superstitious thief, the curse has him spooked, right? So, this brazen, heartless, superstitious, and now superficially penitent thief, son of his mother, returns the silver. But his mother said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my son. Ah, the mom invokes the name of Yahweh in her blessing of her son who stole her silver. Blesses her son, invokes the name of not just Elohim, but Yahweh, the covenant name of God, and then invoking the name of Yahweh, the covenant name for God, what does she do? She leads Micah into idolatry. Look at verse three. So when he had returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son, to make a carved image and a molded image. Now, therefore, I will return it to you. Uh, Micah doesn't want it back. Verse four, thus he returned the silver to his mother. Then his mother took 200 shekels of silver, gave them to the silversmith, and he made it into a carved image and a molded image, and they were in the house of Micah. And I thought, we read the text right, I thought she consecrated all 1,100 shekels. Did she consecrate 1,100 shekels or did she consecrate 200 shekels? I think she consecrated 1,100 shekels. I guess she figured she'd rather have the money. Micah took it. Uh, she missed it. Gave it back. Uh, just I'll consecrate 200, not 1,100. Seems crass, okay? Seems crass, but professing Christians do this all the time. Don't they? Sometimes to our shame, don't we? <laughs> I surrender all to you, Lord. I surrender all to you. And what does that mean? That means an hour on Sunday morning. Okay, okay, okay. I'll give you Sunday morning, but Sunday night is for me. (laughs) Sunday night is for me. I thought you consecrated all to him. What are you holding back? We packed the house in here for Jerome's ordination. And I love that brother. But that brother would be the first to acknowledge that no one was here that night for him. I'll be the first to acknowledge you're not here for me. (laughs) 
Who are we here for? We're here for the Lord. Amen. We're here for the Lord. Pack the house on a Sunday night for that. What about packing the house for the Lord every other Sunday night? It seems to me um, inconsistent. It may be inconsistent at best. It may be hypocritical at worst. You judge for yourselves. Christians are often saying, I love you, Lord, with all my heart. I love you with all my heart, Lord. And what they mean by that is that part of their heart that isn't reserved, already reserved, for all the other things that they love too, in addition to him, right? The stuff they refuse to give up for him. I love you with all my heart, but there's all those things that they reserve for themselves that they're not willing to give up for him, right? It, the mother consecrated 1,100 shekels of silver, and when it came down, when it came down to it, she gave 200. Anani Ananias and Sapphira did the same thing, didn't they? So verse five, the man Micah had a shrine, essentially a private chapel. He essentially had a private chapel and he made an ephod and teraphim. That's what the word is. It means household idols. And he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. What is he doing? He's doing what is right in his own eyes. You see, doing what's right in his own eyes. Dale Ralph Davis calls them Micah's collection of cultic tinker toys. <laughs> That's what Micah's got here. Collection of cultic tinker toys. So, who is like Yahweh, Micah, Micaiah? <laughs> who is like Yahweh? Well, apparently, the incomprehensible God, the creator of the universe, the one from whom, through whom, and to whom are all things, he's like a couple of small silver figurines that you keep in your house and you worship in your private shrine. <laughs> So what was it that Micah and his mother were doing here? They're simply doing what is right in their own eyes. They're simply doing what is right in their own eyes. In those days, verse six, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Well, it wasn't and it isn't right in God's eyes. Do you see? The second commandment of the law, Exodus chapter 20, verse four, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now Micah obviously knew that he was a Jew. Micah knew that he was a Jew. Micah knew that Yahweh was God. They're even using the name of Yahweh to refer to him. It's very likely to be expected that Micah knew the second commandment. He knows the law, but what is he doing? It's called syncretism. It's called syncretism. He's syncretistic. He's blending the worship of God with the idolatrous worship or practices of the pagans. He's blending the worship of God with idolatry, with pagan worship. This is representative of the world's influence on the true worship of God. It's syncretistic, right? Mixing worldliness with worship, mixing paganism with worship, mixing mysticism with worship. It's syncretistic. syncretistic. Well, how does it come in? But if we're gonna mix, if we're gonna mix worldliness with our worship, how does it come in? Here in Judges chapter 17, they're just doing what they think is right in their own eyes, doing what they think is right in their own mind, according to their own imagination, according to their own ideas, their own wisdom, their own philosophy, whatever it is. How does it happen today? It happens in the same way, right? It's devised after man's own mind, devised after his own imagination, devised after his own thinking, and it creeps in in a number of ways through music, through entertainment. Think with me, right? How does worldliness creep into the worship of God's people? How does it come in? It comes in through you and I. It comes in through man. How does it come in through man? It comes in through the trappings that we like to presume are worship of God, and they're not. So what do we do? We introduce our own ideas. We introduce our own thinking, our own feelings, our own preferences, our own thoughts. We introduce that into the worship of God without being informed from the word of God, without subjecting ourselves, without submitting ourselves to the word of God. And how does it come in? It comes in through music, comes in through entertainment, comes in through 
man-centered questions. What do you think the people would like? <laughs> what do you think they would enjoy? Well, we thought about doing, no, nah, they wouldn't enjoy that. Let's do this instead. Where's God in that question, right? Where's the Lord in our decision-making? <laughs> man-centered worship, man-centered entertainment. It's a man-centered social club, most churches today. It affects not only their worship, that attitude, that approach, that way of doing things affects not only their worship, it affects the way they understand the gospel, affects how they preach the gospel, right? I'm not going to preach that because that's not popular, that's not palatable, they're not going to like that, I don't want to offend anyone. Besides, I'm not here to offend anyone, I'm here to be an encourager, right? I'm not going to preach that difficult part of the law because I'm, I just want to encourage everyone. <laughs> Worldliness mysticism, paganism, rebellion. How does it seep in? It seeps into their gospel, seeps into their understanding then of conversion, seeps into the preaching, seeps in, into the prayer, seeps into the singing. Before you know it, you have a worldly, essentially pagan, abominable, so-called worship that isn't honoring to God. It's a stench in his nostrils. And it's a pathway to false conversion, ultimately a pathway to complete apostasy. And what do we see today absolutely bursting at the seams in the professing modern day church, false conversion and apostasy. Verse five, Micah had a little shrine, a private little temple, doing what is right in his own eyes. He had a little shrine, a private little temple when the center of worship was to be in Shiloh. And he's doing it himself. Micah made himself an ephod. An ephod was only to be worn by the priests. Micah made himself teraphim, household idols, a violation of the second commandment. And Micah consecrated one of his sons to serve as his own personal priest. What's he doing? He's doing what is right in his own eyes. Well, this is the way I see it. This is the way I see it. Micah even says as much later in the text, right? This is the way I see it. This is what I think needs to be done. Look how sincere I am. Look how dedicated to worship I am. I have my own shrine. I have my own ephod. Look, I have my own priest. Look how sincere I am. Look how dedicated I am. Look how holy I am. Surely, surely God will be well pleased with me. I was watching a um, documentary uh, a while back. And the documentary was, uh, they were reviewing archaeological digs in Jerusalem, in and around Jerusalem. Fascinating documentary. So they're looking at various archaeological digs that were taking place in and around Jerusalem. And they had this section of the city that they were excavating that were um, public households. So, and they were wealthier households. These were folks who were a little better off living toward the center of the city. And, but uh, many of these apartments, if you will, um, that they were excavating where Jews um, in and before the first century uh, lived in Jerusalem. And what they found, one of the, the things that was sort of mentioned in passing, that as they were walking through the dig site and they're picking up pieces of pottery, they're picking up tablets, things that were scribbled on or etched in, they were picking up figurines everywhere they went. These houses inhabited by God's covenant people prior to, around the time of Jesus Christ, full of household teraphim, little idols, little figurines, violations, every one of them, of the second commandment and the worship of the true and living God. Tragic. They were finding them everywhere. It's tragic. Well, while you presume to worship the one true and living God, you do so with worldly ideas, worldly conceptions, worldly philosophies, worldly music, worldly forms, and worldly traditions. When there is no practical king in your life, when the Lord Jesus Christ isn't king, you do what you think is right in your own eyes. It's as if you don't own a Bible. It's as, it's as if they don't own a Bible. Well, I did pray about it. You know, we prayed about it. 
And we just thought this was the best thing. You know, I felt led. I felt led. <laughs> Verse 6, in those days, as well as in the days that we're living in right now, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. In the true church, Jesus Christ is king. Amen? He rules and reigns over his kingdom in the hearts of his people right now. <laughs> but this world is full of false worship, isn't it? When there was no king in Israel, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Don't you think that? <laughs> like every time you turn on the TV <laughs> today, uh, every time you walk down the street, watch the news, don't you think that when you consider the absurd tripe that is peddled as worship in most churches that claim the name of Christ today? The worship of God being subject to man's passions, man's wisdom, man's desires, man's preferences. And so they build their own little shrines. We're relevant and relational. <laughs> they make their own little ephods they make hirelings, their own little priests. It's an abomination. And we have to ask, we have to ask the question, what about the inconsistency? What about the hypocrisy in our own worship? In my own heart and mind, am I worshiping God in spirit and in truth? informed by the word of God, motivated by the word of God, constrained, hemmed in by the word, the revealed word of God? Is my worship regulated by the word of God? Or is it anything goes in my own heart and mind? Anything goes. When there was no king in Israel, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Our author obviously had in mind a king who wouldn't tolerate that godless nonsense. We have a king that doesn't tolerate it. He obviously had in mind a king who would uphold God's good rule. Well, as we'll see, Micah's worldliness obviously isn't restricted to Micah alone. This was widespread. Look at verse seven. But there was a young man from Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah. He was a Levite, and he was staying there. So wait a minute, verse seven. Is this man a Bethlehemite, or is he a Levite? Which is it? The text says he's a Levite. So what was he doing living in Bethlehem? Why isn't he laboring in the service of God at the tabernacle in Shiloh? Where is he supposed to be right now, right? Verse eight, the man departed from the city of Bethlehem in Judah to stay wherever he could find a place. Wherever he could find a place. Then he came to the mountains of Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. This man is looking for a place to serve as a Levite. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for a place. What Micah had done, building his own little shrine, consecrating his own son, making some household idols, this was obviously widespread in Israel at the time. Here you've got a traveling Bethlehemite slash Levite looking for a place to be employed, looking for a place to stay. This is all over the place. This man is looking for a priestly position wherever he can find it, again, doing what is right in his own eyes. Micah said to him, verse nine, where do you come from? So he said to him, I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm on my way to find a place to stay. Tell me it's not like this today, right? <laughs> Tell me it's not like this today. Young man goes to school, little concern given to his calling, little concern giving to, given to his actual conversion, who has these conversations with him, right? He gets his piece of paper at the end of that effort. He walks across a platform with his piece of paper in hand, and he goes out looking for a place to stay goes out looking for a job. Well, he seems nice, and he's got his piece of paper. Looks like he knows some stuff. Let's make him our hireling. Like, let's make him our personal priest. I once um, had lunch with a young man who was finishing his doctoral work at Southern Seminary. And as we... I hadn't known him before that. we just met. And so as we sat having lunch, um, I wanted to hear his testimony. How did he become a Christian, right? How are things now with him? 
And so we had a conversation. He told me uh, how he was saved, gave me his testimony. I asked him some questions. We had a good conversation about his testimony. And he's finishing his doctoral work at Southern Seminary. And it struck me to ask him, um, in your time through a master's in divinity and now a PhD at Southern Seminary, have you ever had a conversation where anyone sat down with you and asked you about your testimony, asked you about your conversion, asked to know whether or not you're a genuine Christian, or is this the first? And he said, no, this is the first. And so what happens is he's got now this valuable piece of paper, and any church in the land would only be too well pleased to hire a guy that they don't know don't know his family, and maybe they don't ask about his conversion, his testimony, how he was genuinely saved. And now you've got a man preaching, presuming to preach the word of God, standing in the pulpit of some church somewhere who has never been asked these things. It's like we are looking for a bunch of hirelings. Do you see? The system is broken in that sense, the local church is the church that is to affirm that and to the Lord raising up men from among us who we know, we know them, we know their family, we know their testimony, we know there's evidence given that they are genuinely converted. At least have the conversation, right? Well, Micah said to him, verse 10, dwell with me, dwell with me, be a father and a priest to me and I will give you 10 shekels of silver per year and a suit of clothes and your sustenance. And so the Levite went in. Then the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became like one of his sons to him. And listen, this is no ordinary Levite. This is no ordinary Levite. We find out later in chapter 18 that this man's name is Jonathan, and he's the grandson of Moses. My, what a priest you have. All of a sudden, we're in serious business here. There's an air of respectability now to his little private shrine and his little household idols, and right? What a terrible downgrade. My, how far they have fallen. The grandson of Moses. It's interesting, in chapter 18, it said that the scribes later added a suspended nun. It's a Hebrew letter, Hebrew alphabet. A suspended nun to change the name from Moses in Hebrew to Manasseh in Hebrew to save Moses the dishonor of his own grandson acting in such tragic and abominable ways. And Manasseh is an evil, wicked king in Israel. (laughs) So you'll see Manasseh in your New King James Version in chapter 18, verse 30. Other translations will say Moses. Verse 12. So Micah consecrated the Levite, the young man became his priest and lived in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will be good to me since I have a Levite as priest. He professes to believe in the Lord, uses the name Yahweh, the covenant name for the Lord, but there is no fear of God before his eyes. Do you see? He has no difficulty breaking his commandments and worshiping God as seems right to him. What about the book of the law? What about the Bible? He expects, there's an expectation that all will be well with him. And he thinks to himself, the Lord can't do anything but bless me. Look at how sincere I am. I have my own Levite. Not considering that his thoughts are not our thoughts, nor our ways his ways. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 9. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts, says the Lord. What's happening here now in the nation of Israel represented here in this little account of Micah and his personal priest is little different than paganism. The devastating influence of the Canaanites on Israel. Syncretistic worldly worship that is essentially pagan. Micah believes himself to be doing well. He has a Levite for a priest we consider the application of this text in our own experience what Levite priest are you holding on to what Levite priest the Lord would be pleased 
with me. Look at this area or look at that area. I memorized a whole chapter of the Bible last week. The Lord would certainly be pleased with me when you won't give up your sin, <laughs> when you won't give up your preferences, when you won't give up your desires, when you won't give up worldly wisdom, when you won't give up worldliness. What Levite priest are you holding on to? Is it some experience that you had? Surely the Lord is pleased with me because look what I did for him back then when I was 15, back then when I was 21, 22. Some decision you made in the past, some service you used to perform, some service you perform now. The church that you belong to, right? Is that a Levite priest to you? The Lord would certainly be pleased with me. I go to this church. Maybe a friend is your Levite priest, reassuring you that all is well. You refuse to give him up because he's a worldly influence on you. Or, or do you let go of that idolatrous priest and heed the word of God? Submit yourselves to the word of God. When you abandon the world, the word, you embrace the world. When you abandon the word, you embrace the world. There is no in-between. Worldliness has infiltrated the church with everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. You and I need to be concerned with, concerning ourselves entirely with what is right in his eyes. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you. Lord, you have saved us. You have sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to live a perfectly righteous life, to go to the cross in our place, bearing our own sin in his own body on the tree, standing in our place as your wrath undiluted poured out upon him for our transgressions. And we praise you, Lord, for that gift that sacrifice, praise you that it's by his stripes we are healed. But now, Lord, having been set free from sin, having turned from sin, may we worship you in spirit and in truth. Guide us, inform us according to your word. Lead us by your spirit. Convict us, Lord, as we walk the course of this world as worldliness would seep into our hearts and minds. Help us, Lord, to consider how we might consecrate ourselves more wholly to you, putting off the old man, putting on the new man, separating, our, separating ourselves more from the, the trappings of worldly wisdom and worldly philosophy and worldly thinking and worldly preferences and worldly desires, worldly imaginations. Help us, Lord, to think more on you, to keep our eyes fixed on eternal and unseen things in the heavenlies. And may we worship you rightly as you are worthy to be worshipped. Lord, it's our joy to worship you in that way. And we look forward to the day when the systems of this world that seek to undermine true worship will be cast down and Jesus Christ uh, crowned over his kingdom and you exalted we know he reigns even now. We pray, Lord, come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen.